as a result of that, that company was taken over by, it was actually acquired by Mancini Duffy, which is how I came here, which I always joke around. It was, you know, basically me and the furniture that came here. Now that we've moved offices, <laughs> it's just me. But. Welcome to Obsessed Show, a podcast that is designed to inspire, featuring some of the most creative people in the world. I'm your host, Josh Miles. Let's talk about today's episode. Today on Obsessed Show, I'm excited to chat with the CEO and co-owner of Mancini Duffy, Bill Mandera. If that firm sounds familiar, it's because we interviewed a few folks from Mancini Duffy earlier this year, Christian Giordano and Jessica Man Amato. I'm excited to learn more about Bill's role in the firm, a massive project they're working on in the heart of Times Square, and his music. So without further ado, please enjoy this conversation with Bill Mandera. Okay, kids, all the way from New York City, I'm chatting with Bill Mandera. Bill, welcome to Obsessed Show. Hey there, thanks for having me. Hey, we've got lots of ground to cover today. And uh, before we get into your origin story, I understand there's a really important topic that we have to cover. And that is, is it true that you've seen Rush like 30 times live? Probably more than that. Ever since uh, I think I was a freshman in high school, anytime they came to the New York City area, I uh, I, I grew up worshiping Rush and still uh, still consider them the uh, the highest level of music ever to be created. <laughs> That's pretty impressive to catch them 30 times. Um, all the shows in New York or have you traveled around with them a bit too? Mostly in the New York area, um, you know, living here, living where I live in northern New Jersey, you have the luxury of when a band, particularly in the 80s and 90s, when they would come through here, they would play Madison Square Garden, uh, they would play in New Jersey and East Rutherford, they would play in Long Island and Nassau Coliseum, and then in the summer, you know, there's, there's summer venues and there's three or four of those, so there's enough venues in the general, you know, 50 to 60 mile radius of where I live in North Jersey where you could go see several shows on one tour. Very cool. I think there's something about we as creative people uh, really nerding out on other people who are especially creative or prolific in their in their type of art. Um, and I want to dig into your music as well here eventually. But maybe before we do that, um, you know, we had Christian and Jessica on uh, kind of January, I think, of 2022. to So to date stamp this, we're going into the holidays 2022, almost uh, to 2023. And uh, I'm curious to hear your origin story and kind of your role um, for for those of our listeners and viewers who haven't watched Christian and Jessica's episode yet. Mancini Duffy is a, a hundred year old plus firm that you guys basically refounded, restarted, kind of took on for yourselves. And uh, I'm kind of curious to hear um, your origin story, like how you found yourself in this place and your role in the kind of reformation of Mancini Duffy. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, I, I always joke around. I was probably the, the least likely person to uh, to be an owner here or, or, or at the position that I am at this particular firm. Um, but I, I started out, you know, came from a long line of people in the business. My my grandfather was a, a subcontractor. My dad was a general contractor. And it was kind of predetermined. Somebody, you know, ignited me when I was like five years old or whatever that I was going to be in in the profession in one way or another. And, um, you know, architects seemed to make sense to me because I spent a lot of time um, either with my dad or my grandfather in construction trailers, in the sites, looking at drawings, you know, um, tracing drawings and, and going through them and listening to my uh, both my father and my grandfather talk about how terrible architects are and how much they hated them. So, kinda, <laughs> so of course, they encouraged you to I take on the mantle of architects. <laughs> A hundred. Listen, you could you could make the case that a lot of my career is um, learning what not to do and, and going from that. Um, you know, I, I've, not that I haven't had you know a lot of people I've learned from in a positive way, but I've certainly had a share of people that I've worked for or with over the years that I've learned exactly what not to do. Um, so you know, from there, I went to architecture school. I uh, really kind of did that to keep my parents at bay because I wanted to do music. That was really my true passion. I probably spent most of middle school locked up in my parents' basement playing drums, guitar, whatever I could get my hands on, learning songs and, and music. Um, somewhere around my mid-20s, uh, you know, I was playing in a couple different bands and the, the cover band circuit, whatever. It, it became apparent that I should probably take the architecture thing a little more seriously because, uh, you know, I'm not going to make a ton of money. 
I, I have expensive habits and spend spend so much, <laughs> spend more money than I than I right. generally have. So the music thing wasn't really realistic. So um, I, you know, I, I I jumped into the deep end of architecture and still still kept the music thing going. But um, yeah, I worked at a small firm in New Jersey for about 10, 11 years. Um, grew along with that firm. I uh, had an opportunity in 2006 to open up and co-manage an office in New Jersey for a New York City firm, which I did. Um, and we were pretty successful. And then, like a lot of people, the you know everything kind of stopped in 2009, to 2008, 2009 with that crash. As a result of that, that company was taken over by it was actually acquired by Mancini Duffy, which is how I came here. Which I always joke around. It was you know basically me and the furniture that came here. Now that we've moved <laughs> offices, it's just me. But, um, it was about 50, 60 people. It was a rough transition. Um, you know, probably about more than half of them were gone within six months. Um, and then, you know, it was it, it was kind of a slow bloodletting of people letting go. And it was there's nobody in particular to blame for that. It was just a, uh, you know, differences of kind of different philosophies of how to work. And and, um, you know, or within a few months, they decided that the New Jersey office just wasn't it was fine, but it just wasn't happening. So they invited me to come to the city at the time. I had, you know, my children were significantly younger and I had the luxury of you know, when you're running office, you can pick where it is. So I had the luxury of having an office about 10 minutes from my home. So, you know, as, as you know, architecture is not a nine to five job. It's, you know, it's not even a nine to nine job. But, you know, I had the luxury of whenever my kids are in grammar school and they had their Christmas plays or teaching parent teacher conferences, or whatever, I could I could bolt out, go to school, be there for my kids and family and then just go back to the office and do what I had to do. So it was it was pretty great. And I wasn't quite sure I wanted to be in the city. Um, although I went to college in the city and I've always lived, you know, with, within view of the city, I wasn't quite sure that's where I wanted to be. Uh, a couple of people were like, listen, just stick with it, go there for a while. And when I first came to Mancini, I was kind of like, this is not the firm for me. It is, uh, it was, it was and not, not a bad thing. It just wasn't me. It was, it was, I was a, very much a square peg in a round hole. It was very, very buttoned up tie, you know, we did, you know, whatever, like perfectly iron pants and shoes and, and everybody was, and everybody was so quiet. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm of Italian descent. I'm from New Jersey and, you know, all those stereotypes kind of hold true. And I was, in <laughs> you've made it through this I whole just... podcast without talking with your hands. I mean, I don't even know how you did it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But, you know, like we're, it, it just wasn't my type of thing. So, um, I was kind of riding it out. I'm like, all right, you know, there were some good people here, but I'm going to try and stick around. And I didn't necessarily see the opportunity that was there. Um, and, when, and then Christian came along um, and he came, he was, you know, he was brought here for the specific reason of taking the firm into the, you know, to the next generation and moving it forward. And him and I, ironically enough, the the night before he started here, we had a mutual friend and we were all out having a couple of drinks and having dinner and, and, we we made very quick friends. It was, uh, you know, we, we realized we have a lot in common, although outwardly quite different. We're actually very, very similar, very, you know, very similar upbringings, very similar views on life and things. And it, it became apparent that I had not only, you know, made made a new friend, but somebody I could I could really do this with. So he he explained the opportunity in the way he saw it here to take over this firm and buy it from the previous ownership and I was, I, I went all in with them and I kind of took a flyer on it. Thankfully, my wife is super cool. She's like, whatever you do, what you got to do. I, I don't, you know, I'll be here and support <laughs> you. And, you know, the previous ownership was great. Uh, Christian, Christian came up with a plan, ran it past me. I'm like, yeah, I'm in. And we did it. We executed it. It took a little while. And, you know, again, the previous ownership, I have to, especially Tony Sharip, I have to give him all the credit and thanks in the world because they were very supportive and they really made it easy. And here we are. And, and and with that, we were able to really build a firm how we wanted it. And, you know, I go back to that first night that we were hanging out over, you know, probably too many drinks and some steaks and sharing our views on what it's, you know, where we how, where we would want to work and the type of firm we would want, the things we both experienced over the years that we we, we don't want to repeat. You know, it's, it's, it's a balance between Hey, I, I I ran this gauntlet, and so should everybody else. And and 
do we really want to repeat that? Do we really want to do that? And let's let's try and make things better and different for for moving forward. So we we had similar views, and we were able to we were able to do it. And even before we took over the firm, that's why I, I give so much credit to Tony in particular, but all the previous ownership. They kind of let us have the reins and said, okay, you know, this is going to happen. This is it might not happen for a year or so, but you guys start this, and we were able to reshape the firm exactly how we wanted it into what we have now. And we've we've since brought on other other owners, including, including Jessica, who you mentioned before, and Scott, Harrow, and, and our CFO, Bola. And we were able to bring these folks in who also have you know similar views as to we do of the world. And it's been great. And it's been an amazing opportunity that, you know, when I first, uh, it was the day after President's Day 2012, and it was my first day coming to the New York office for Mancini. And I sat down, I'm like, I'm not even bringing like the photos off of my desk because there's zero chance I'm going to be here more than a couple of weeks. And, you know, 10 years later, here we are. It's, it's pretty cool. <laughs> and not just there, but also CEO. Um, how has uh, that role been for you in that, uh, you know, you, you come from technical side of things, you're an architect by background. So uh, being both CEO and an architect, you know, what, what do your duties look like or what's a, you know, knowing there's no such thing probably as a normal day, uh, but but what are kind of the typical things that you might find yourself doing during the week? I, I mean, listen, I, I I always joke around that my my job, you know, Christians one of his primary functions is to bring work in, and my my work my job is to make sure that work goes out and we don't get sued, right? Um, <laughs> but it's more complicated than that, I guess. But it is kind of boil it down, but. No, I, I mean, listen, I, I'm, I, I love my job. I'm very grateful for it. It involves a lot of different things. You know, it is, I am the one who signs and seals most of the projects in the office. So it's my responsibility to have people in place that I trust that are super talented and super technically aware of things that that can help me share in the responsibility of, of making sure everything's done properly. And ultimately, you know, everything has to get past my desk to sign and seal and review. And make sure it's done properly. Again, I'm 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 very fortunate that we have a lot of really really talented, really smart people here, so it's not that hard of a job. Um, you know, then there's the operation, running the operations of the firm, which I, I work in very close tandem with Bola, our CFO. Um, you know, we 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 talk several times a day, if not more than that. So it's you know, in the oper helping with the operations of the firm both financially and, you know, making sure people have the resources they need. And then probably one of my favorite aspects of my job really is just problem solving. You know, I, I, we, our new office here, we, we don't have assigned desks. And the first day we came here, I sat on a little couch we have that's kind of in the middle of the desk with my, my, my MacBook. And it was interesting because people just kept coming over. Hey, Bill, uh, you know, this happened. What do you think? How can I do it? And, However, months more. However, months later, that we've been in the office now. That's my spot. Everybody jokes around. It's my office in the couch, but it's actually great. And and I really enjoy when you know people come to me with if it's a problem, if it's hopefully not too bad a problem, but you know helping people through things and looking at things maybe a little bit differently and, and helping working through it. It's funny how even in a space without assigned desks, it's probably like you know, the lunchroom when you're a kid, like everybody goes and sits in the same place, even though they don't have to. So it's, it's uh, you know, everybody does. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> we have a reservation system, but I still see the same kind of people in the same spots. I, I was, by the way, it was Jessica's idea who you spoke with before to, to have the free, you know, kind of free address thing, because we, we have to practice what we pre preach for our clients. Me, it was very territorial. I mean, I literally, this is, really kind of my only second job that I've had and professional job. And mm -hmm. I live a couple hundred yards from the house I grew up in, in the same town. You know, I've known my wife since I was like 21. So I'm not, I'm not somebody other than cars, which I seem to go through a lot. I'm not somebody who <laughs> likes big sweeping life changes. So I like my stuff and my spot, but it's uh, it's actually been great. Well, you kind of touched on the team a little bit. I'm curious to hear, um, uh, I, I think Christian and I probably touched on this a little bit. I'm curious to hear how Mancini Duffy is shaped, especially in a, um, if, if it's fair to call it a post COVID world, how, how virtual is your team? How many people are regularly coming in and how kind of spread out are they geographically otherwise? Yeah, sure. So we're, you know, we're predominantly our, we do have some staff that's remote that doesn't live in the tri or work in a tri state area. Um, and which is great. They're super talented people and it's great to have, it, it's actually, one of the good things about COVID, not that there's a lot, but one, you know, one positive result, I would say, is that 
the idea of having somebody who lives on the West Coast who's, you know, super talented and valuable is now a viable option for us where five years ago, somebody was like, oh, do you want to hire, you know, our marketing director, by way of example, is in Seattle. Um, and she's fantastic. She's, she's outstanding. And five years ago, I would have been like, Seattle, what? Like, no, 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 no. Come to New York City. But, you know, that's, it's, all that stuff has become a reality. So overall, though, our, our, we're, 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 we, we, our policy is that people have to be in the office three days of the week. Um, two days they can they can flex. They're more than welcome to come in more, um, but they can they can work from home. We also have two two other offices, one in northern New Jersey and one in southern New Jersey, where people have the option of going there. As somebody, you know, that's a good thing about the free address. If somebody lives near one of those offices, they can come there. They can come to the city. They can kind of come wherever they want. Me personally, I'm in the office at least four days a week. I try and be in five just because for my job in particular. It's, you know, a lot of those chance meetups with people and people see you there that really gets a lot of things done. By way of example, um, I have this and a couple other things and I have a planning board hearing this evening in New Jersey. So I was just I woke up today thinking I'm just going to work from home. I won't have to come to the city. I'll go, you know, I'll go drive down to this meeting. And I, I something just I was like, no, no, I'm going to come to the office. So I came to the office and literally within five minutes of being here, I wound up having a meeting with a, a, a coworker where we, you know, we solved some issues that were out there. And that wouldn't have happened if if I wasn't there just to kind of grab and say, hey, Bill, you got a minute? So I I, I do believe that as architects, as, as creative people, um, collaboration is so important. And you need to be there. You need to be there with each other. It's okay if you have heads down work to be to be home and go home and do that. But in particular, in leadership, you have to be there more so than you're not. And and again, we design places where people work, where people go to vacation, where people eat, all of those good things. If we designed single family homes, I'd be like, cool, like sit in your home and be like, look, I'm an expert. Look, look how awesome my home is. And um, <laughs> But, we, you know, we don't. We, we, we design residential projects, but they're all large multifamily projects. So it's we kind of again, I, I, I'm, I'm a big lead by example guy. I think that if, if you're not living it, it's kind of hard to tell people to do it. Sure. Uh, you know, one thing maybe some of our listeners don't realize is when I'm not behind the microphone, a lot of my professional experiences in marketing and branding around architecture, engineering, and construction. Um, and one of the things that's really interesting to me about your industry, this industry in particular, is how relationship driven the the sales process is and how reputation driven it is. And I, I'm really curious to hear your perspective, especially as someone, as you said, you know, your job is to get the work done, not necessarily to bring it in. Um, but from where you sit, what do you feel like is the most effective for Mancini Duffy when it comes to bringing in new business and new projects and winning work? A hundred percent relationship based. Um, I, and I, 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 you know, I, I joke around, but I do bring in, you know, a fair, fair amount of work. It's part of my responsibilities and all of that, literally all of that is, is all relationship based because, at the end of the day, especially if we were somewhere else, it might be different. But um, here in New York City, there's just tons and tons of great architectural firms. I may like them. I may not like them, but that's irrelevant. There's a <laughs> lot of you, you can go to all these places and everybody's going to do a good job, right? You're going to, you know, for the most part, let's say 80 percent of them are going to do a really good job. To me, it's a matter of respecting the fact that when a lot of our clients, this isn't what they do every day, right? I do this every day. They're, they're off there. They're off managing their business. And, and, and this interruption of having to, whether it's move a space or, or even if they're developers, you know, developers are thinking about what the next deal is and how to make it all work. And the idea of the project itself happening isn't necessarily their day-to-day -day focus. So you, we have to make it easy on them. And to me, the, Doing it with somebody you like and somebody who you click with and somebody who's cool and you don't mind, you know, whether it's grabbing a beer or a cup of coffee or, or a slice of pizza or something with is is so important. And and knowing that they have your best interests in mind. And again, listen, nobody's perfect, but if stuff does go sideways, you have a person you can call or text and be like, hey, listen, this happened. And you're like, no problem. Got it. It's going to get done. It's so to me, it's it's a hundred percent relationship based. I will 
I always joke around. I mean, I, I literally, I'll move a door for somebody and, 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 and I'll build a shed in their backyard if, if it's an opportunity to show that, you know, me and, and, and more, more, more importantly, the, the, the folks in our firm will go the extra mile and we'll do a great job for you. And you're going to have fun doing it, right? Because again, it was actually great when we moved our space because it was a good example for all the folks here that really worked their butts off and, 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 and spent a lot of time on it, you know, cause it was like, you have all your projects, but then you had this project of moving our office that wasn't your focus. And it was a great lesson for everybody that this is what our clients go through. And, you know, <laughs> right. uh, hopefully you're going to have fun doing it because it can be, it can be an arduous, uh, unpleasant task otherwise. We mentioned developers a minute ago. I understand it's, uh, you know, very popular in lots of markets to bring in mixed use and add retail. And, um, but, but let me get this straight, this big project you guys are working on right now, somebody looked at the palace theater in times square and said, you know what, we should lift that puppy 30 feet in the air and put some more stuff under it. So I'm, I'm really curious to hear about this project because this hundred year old building in times square, um, which seems like a really big project for you guys. I'm curious to hear, you know, how you won the project, what the background was and how long this is going to go on. Yeah, sure. So I wish I could say it was my idea, but it wasn't. Um, somebody came to <laughs> us, gosh, maybe in like 2015, 2016, it was a long time ago. Um, but somebody came to this, uh, us with this idea and it was one of my, uh, it was one of the former partners here who actually had the relationship came in. I remember he came to me on like a Friday afternoon and he's like, hey, listen, I need to have, I need like three or four people to come in this weekend and do this study. You know, they want to put a, a an amusement park or a roller coaster in Times Square and they're going to raise the palace here and all this stuff. And I was like, look, number one, are we going to get paid for this? Because if we're going to like ruin people's weekends, which I don't like doing, but if we're going to do it, I hope everybody's going to get paid and you're going to take care of all these people, buy them some nice you know, some nice dinner or something. And, and let's, and, and we, when we did, we, we got paid for it and we did the study and then it was another study and then it was another study. And, um, you know, Christian and I were always joking around. It was like one of us would, you know, would remove a body part if this was really ever happened to be a project. And then lo and behold, as you know, it got a little more serious. It was like, holy cow, this is uh, really They're actually going to do then, this thing. Know, <laughs> yeah. It was like, wow, this is going to happen, huh? And then uh, when l and Holdings bought the project, we were like, okay, this is actually a real thing. So we we have to develop a team for this because at the time we really didn't have an appropriate team for that. We didn't have you – know, we had a few folks that had been working on it and, and working really hard on it. But, you know, to do a project like this, we really had to assemble an incredible team. So, I mean, what the project ultimately evolved to is, like you said, taking the Palace Theater, which is a landmark historical – theater raising it 30 feet to create new space below it and around it and most importantly really to the, the palace theater as most broadway theaters opened up onto times square and you would go in there to this this shallow lobby where you know people would get crammed in there and people would be going in and out trying to get a smoke break during intermission or something like that and then by raising it we we, we moved the entrance of it to 47th street which then just creates this whole new space. So what happened was there was a project in the late 80s where they built the Doubletree Hotel on top of the Palace Theater. Um, so what we had to do is we took that hotel down and we put a new hotel in its place. So when we raised the theater, um, I'm trying to go in order over here, but <laughs> it's we um, by creating that, you know, we 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 removed the hotel, we we raised the theater. But the reality is, is when they built that hotel in the 80s you would not be able to build that now per the current zoning regulations. So what we had to do is we had to make this project an alteration rather than a new building because the New York City zoning code allows you to do that if you keep 25% of the floor area of the building, which we did. And uh, in particular, thanks to a guy, John McCampbell here, who's one of the lead architects on the project, and he's a very smart guy. He spent hours and hours and hours literally painstakingly finding every little piece of floor you could keep in that building. So we did that, and then ultimately, what the project is is now you have this brand new store, brand new hotel. Um, you have three floors of food and beverage, whatever it's going to be, with 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 roof decks to go out onto Times Square. 
you have the Palace Theater, which is also being restored. At the time, it was, you know, it was kind of like the last show they had there was SpongeBob SquarePants. And it wasn't, you know, it wasn't necessarily in its past glory. So that 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 thing has been completely, is being completely restored to every little ornamental piece of plaster is being redone. Um there's a new front of house lobby for that that's on the third floor. There's all new back of house spaces like dressing rooms and all that for talent. It's all going to be amazing. And then we've created this space below and around it, which will be used for retail. There's there's an entertainment space. There's there's a stage that with the world's largest LED doors, which are now currently in store installed, that will open up to Times Square. And you could have everything from the New Year's Eve thing with whoever not Dick Clark is these days. I'm dating myself, but I don't even know who, who doesn't. <laughs> Seacrest or you could somebody? Have, oh, that guy? That guy's still <laughs> I think so. You could, uh, I just remember that horrible American Idol show that, in my opinion, helped ruin music. But anyway, <laughs> they um, – you could have that. You you could have you could have the NFL draft. You could have you know you you could have you two could go there and do a show, um, which can they can close the doors and flip it in and have more of an intimate, intimate experience as well. So it's really a remarkable building. There the the whole facade, the lower facade of the building on the base is all LED screens, which with with technology in there that's going to be unbelievable. The mm -hmm. facade itself below it on the tower portion actually has built-in led nodes which we, we called pucks but they're all each one of these there's this i couldn't even tell you how many of them there's an ungodly amount of them but they're all addressable and you could you know you you can project whatever you want about this building it's really going to be it's really a, it's going to be a technological marvel and it's right there in times square which is you know across from the tkts booth and i i would say that again embarrassingly this is I'm only a few years away from doing this for 30 years now, and this is uh, by far and away the most complicated, uh, most high-profile, cool project I've ever worked on. And, you know, by me talking about it, I, I do want to make sure the people working on it get the credit because, you know, I, while I sign and seal the drawings and are responsible for making sure they have resources and know about the project, they're, you know, I don't want to be corny, but they're, they're the real people that deserve all the credit, all, all of our team that's working on it there and all the other teams too. And there's other architects on the project, there's engineers, there's a myriad of consultants and then developer too. So it's, it's, it's an incredible project and it's been an honor to be a part of it. Well, sure. Like, like anything else we talk about today, if there's anything you want to include on the show notes page, we can always list out the, uh, cast of dozens of folks sure. who've helped out with that. So, uh, listener, be sure to head over to the show notes page over at obsessedshow.com and, and find all the goodies there. Um, I actually was nerding out a little bit on Google street view, looking at the, you know, cause you can kind of see it under construction there and there's signage right. about raising the building and all that stuff. So it was, I wasn't sure if it was going to show like the before or if it was going to show the construction, but it was pretty cool that it was kind of current on that. You um, never know what Google, yeah. You never know right. what Google street is going to get you. And it's funny when, you know, it was, it was a very, it was a really raising the theater itself was incredible. And the, 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 the people that did it, I mean, the, the different iterations they came through to get to how it was done was really, really kind of remarkable. Um, the only thing I'll say was when it was done, it was almost kind of anticlimactic, at least for me. I was expecting some kind of big moment with explosions and, you know, and everything. And I was actually having lunch in the city and I got a text from one of my guys. He's like, theater's there. I'm like, oh, huh, how about it? And I, and I, you know, I, <laughs> I, I got done with my lunch and I walked over there and I'm like, yeah, there it is. Look at that. It's, and, it's know, higher than it used to be. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, I'd always joked around that as soon as that thing started moving up, I was going to book myself a plane ticket to a country with no extradition treaties. But alas, it all worked. <laughs> no jail time for you after all. Uh, my, my kids and my wife appreciate that. <laughs> Did they end up keeping the roller coaster concept? No, 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 no. Okay. That was that was just kind of a, <laughs> scrapped a early. Idea that, <laughs> Yeah, that was that, that was a weekend that a bunch of people worked really hard on some models and concepts of that. I guess all, all, uh, but it was all part of the iterative process, I guess. And then, when is this supposed to be completely finished? Or it sounds like it's getting close. It's getting close. They're looking at um, you know TCO this year. Um, I don't know if it's going to be Q one or Q two, but definitely TCO this year. It's well underway to that. I mean, the building's enclosed. It's I mean, the topping off ceremony was last January. 
Um, so it's look, it, it's happening, and, and it's funny because it's this is one of those things that's gone on for so while. I remember when they actually started construction on this, the developer gathered the entire team, which is a lot of people, and kind of gave us one of those like Alec Baldwin and Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross kind of moments where it was like, look, this is happening. So, you know, you all better make sure that you have your new, your, all your new, your, your, you know what together here. Um, <laughs> and it was, it's just one of those things that had kind of been around for so long to see it happening. It was really, really, it's cool and crazy and surreal at the same time. Well, maybe it's hard to think back to a time you weren't working on this project, but um, outside of this one in particular, what are what are some of your favorite things to work on right now? So I mean, we're, we're, we work on one of the things that Christian and I wanted to do when we first took over the company was really diversify what we do. So, I mean, we at the time were probably like 80, 90 percent corporate interiors when I first came to the firm, which, again, was a square peg round hole thing for me because I had always been more of a base building guy. I've done a little bit of everything, you know, even, even industrial stuff. So, I mean, right now we're working on so many different types of projects. We're working on medical, we're doing a lot of medical work, life sciences work, and we're still doing corporate interiors. We're doing industrial work. We're doing hotels. We're doing restaurants. But what really, uh, we really kind of, I love doing is the building repositioning work, which we do quite a bit of as well. Um, and that's, you know, TSX is really kind of the ultimate building repositioning project, but on a much smaller scale, we do a lot, a lot of that work. And I really enjoy it because it involves taking generally a building that is, you know, past its prime is kind of, you know, uh, let's call it a distressed asset or something and making it something cool because there's so many opportunities there. And in particular in New York City, it's not like there's a lot of room to build new buildings here right yeah you know, i mean I think the last you know hudson yards was kind of the last big development and i still still wish they built built the jet stadium here instead but there's not a lot of room for that it's really about taking what's there and reusing it and making it to its highest and best level and and, and i love that we've done so many of those projects in particular you know we we wrapped up 888 broadway a couple of years ago which was or a year ago i think which was a you know historic landmark building where we we added a new lobby. We changed the use of it. We, we we added excess floor area to the roof and the penthouse. We we have a lot of those projects. Some of them in the outer boroughs. Some of them in Manhattan. And those I really just get a lot of uh, satisfaction from because I like the idea of you can go. I like the before and after kind of shot, you know. And I like the idea of you can go there and be like, hey, this was kind of this beat up piece of crap, and now it's something really cool that people, you know. Landlords are getting, you know, premium rents for people are enjoying and it's and, and and it's something not only aesthetically pleasing, but it's it's a good use of something otherwise that, you know, somebody could have somebody could have torn down and thrown in a landfill somewhere or redeveloped. But it's it, I get a lot of satisfaction from that type of work. Maybe this is a good segue then. Tell us about um, one of your proudest professional moments. Uh, proudest professional moment. It's, it's hard to put it into one moment, but I, I can tell you that um, TSX has to be pretty much among, uh, uh, around the top over there. And you know that when there's been, I wouldn't say one, it's probably a series of moments with that project, mostly when, you know, people I know, whether it's my family or, you know, my, my son taking his girl walking through Times Square and being like, hey, that's my dad's project over there. Or, um, you know, watching a TV show filmed in New York City and you're like, oh, there's TSX. There it is over there. And <laughs> and all of the uh, all of the kind of fun stuff that's gone with it. That, that It's definitely my proudest moment because I never in a million years thought I'd be working on a project of this scale. I mean, you know, early on in my career, I was doing, you know, not my, 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 much less sexy projects. And, you know, it's it's. And I think seeing it all come together too and, and seeing how our team really came together and really rose to the occasion. It, it's, it's definitely my proudest professional moment or series of moments, I guess. I hate, hate to hijack your question. Or <laughs> no, that works. Um, it's a related question. I mean, you said you've been doing this about 30 years uh, and TSX being a like kind of the crown jewel. Um, any dream projects that that you'd love to work on in the future or anything that's been in the back of your head of like, man, someday I want to do this kind of, this kind of project too. You know, I mean, honestly, 
Yeah, there's, there's things I'd love to do. I'm a, I'm a big sports fan. I'd love to do a you know a hockey a hockey arena or a football stadium or something like that, and really really lead the charge on that. But I would tell you that in, in a perfect world, I would really just be working on projects with clients that I enjoy spending time with. Um, again, it's it's really to me less about the project, more about the folks involved in the project, because at the end of the day. Um, you know, projects are what we do, but relationships are what you remember. You don't necessarily remember that. Or, I mean, we always remember stuff, but, you know, you don't necessarily always remember every detail of everything, but you remember the experiences and the people behind it. So to me, it's really about um, the folks we work with. Um, anything that you look out for, like in a new potential client relationship, any particular red flags or for maybe for young architects or designers listening, you know, considering a client relationship, what, what jumps out to you as kind of a no-go? To me, it's somebody that accepts or expects pretense. Um, you know, for me, look, uh, I've been doing this a while and, and, and thankfully being myself has worked. Uh, I've never, I've never ever experienced any success in trying to be someone or something that I'm not. So to me, anybody that when I, and thankfully it doesn't happen too often, but you know, when I encounter people that are expecting some, you know, some level of pretense and not accepting people for who they are, that's, that's like a huge red flag to me because um, it sounds corny, but you know, being everybody being themselves and their unique personalities and accepting everybody for that is what makes everything great. Um, making expecting somebody who's going to wear a particular type of clothes or speak in a, a particular way, I think uh, isn't great. And there's a lot of that around. And thankfully, you know, we don't experience it too much. I have, I won't obviously won't name names, but I have in my career. And those are times where I've kind of asked to step aside because it's just not for me. I, I, I like people that are, you know, and it doesn't mean any one particular type of people or any one type of attitude or anything like that. I just like when people are themselves and, and, and project that and, and are cool with it. Yeah. Regardless of how it is. Yeah. That's really good. Um, so maybe along those lines, any, uh, favorite pieces of advice that you've received in your career, or maybe a favorite piece of advice to pass along to, uh, to your team? I, I would say so, you know, earlier on in my career, I had a little, I still have a little bit of a temper, but, you know, I, I think I learned to get that under control. And I think that, you know, taking a deep breath and, and um, not reacting so quickly is probably the best advice I've ever gotten. Um, but that's pretty specific to me and my, you know, my, my, uh, <laughs> I don't want to say short views. It's gotten a lot longer. But, <laughs> and, and, and anyway, how I used to, how I used to kind of get a little upset early on back earlier in my career. But I would say, again, related to the last question, I would say the best piece of advice I can give anybody is just be yourself, whether, you know, be who you are. And if people don't like it, then they're not the people for you to work with. Um, you know, we, as one of the things here, we encourage everybody to be themselves with you, you know, for, for whatever that is, because you're never going to get anywhere. You're just never going to get anywhere putting up a facade um, architecture pun, I guess there, but you're never going to get anywhere not being yourself. <laughs> and, and if, even if you do, do you really want to be there? Well, something I've asked everybody who's ever been on the show, um, and your answer can be anything categorically. So it could be work, could be design, could be fun, leisure, whatever. Um, but I'm curious to hear what you find that you are most obsessed with right now. I'm, I'm, I'm realistically, I'm obsessed with making music. Um, it's it's what I don't I would say my 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 wife and kids keep me grounded. Um, but it's what what I do to keep myself from kind of really going crazy sometimes. Um I, I just love it. I've always loved music. I've always I've always made music, I've always been in bands, I've always done things I've but I think in this there's a lot of good things and bad things about this digital age we're in, but the ability the ability to set up your own studio at your home and, and, and just make music and, and whether it's good, bad, people like it, people hate it. That's really what I've been obsessed with. And, um, you know, there's, there's when everybody goes to bed or something, I usually will run down to my studio for a few hours and just kind of start doing whatever I want to do. And if it's good, great. If it's, if it's crappy, then that's fine, whatever. But, but that's probably what my, uh, what I'm obsessed with. 
So I understand you've taken this a little further than most that you've actually got a album out on Spotify. Tell our listeners a little bit about that. I, I do. I, I just released my second one um, last month. I, initially during COVID, we were renovated my house and I finally got a, a room to myself, which was pretty cool. And it was, you know, started functioning as an office for teams meetings and things like this. And then I started slow, you know, then I moved my drum kit in there and I started moving equipment in there. And then by uh, a lot of a lot of process of elimination, a lot of mistakes, I wound up building my own studio over there. And in the process of that, I've always played multiple instruments. And in the process of that, my son, my older son, who was in high school at the time, was in a lot of plays. And and I was like, wow, this 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 this, this dude can sing pretty well. And we started working together and I was like, Hey, listen, I got these songs. What do you think? And he started singing and we, um, we cobbled it all together. And in the summer of 21, I released it all as an album, which was really cool. It was a great experience with, with my son. It was, it was amazing. And, um, I just kept going, writing songs and, you know, he's in college now. So every once in a while, he'll, he'll have some time for his, his, his dad to, to record some things. And then I kind of got over my own phobia of, of singing, which uh, still not quite there yet, but I uh, <laughs> put together another album that I released in, in, in last month, and I've probably got about six or seven new songs I'm working on. And again, it's just something I I, I get a lot of enjoyment out of, um, and I just just throw it out there. And if you know people like it, great. If people don't like it, that's fine. I, I you know I, I don't mean that. I mean that in the nicest way possible. Like I don't like I I went to architecture school, so if you want to tell me that. You know, I, my my guitar playing kind of sucks. That's okay. I can I can tell me tell me what sucks about it, and I'll work on that and get better. Um, so that's yeah, that's 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 what I've been doing. Then, are you performing the music anywhere? Or is it just purely a studio thing? Unfortunately, no. Um, I had been playing with a great group of guys right before COVID. Um, one, one, one a very good friend of mine of I've known for a long time invited me to come play with his band, and we. We spent, you know, several months practicing and played a show in, in December of 2019, and it was great, and everything was going forward, and then, you know, the world kind of stopped, and so I, I haven't been performing. I'd love to. Um, I just haven't had the opportunity necessarily to perform live, but I certainly have some other friends of mine that if if uh, if they need a drummer, I'm, I'm around, and I'd be happy to perform. I did a lot of, did a lot of that in my younger days in particular in the nineties with uh, various bands I was in, we'd play all up and down the New Jersey circuit, sometimes in New York city, sometimes in upstate New York and different places. Um, certainly enjoy it. We actually, there's a lot of, there's a few folks in the office here. Um, we've gotten together before we, we couldn't pull it together for our holiday party this year, but we've gotten before and played some, played our office holiday party for people and, you know, mix of cover songs and stuff. There's some, it's interesting in 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 um, architecture and engineering in particular how many talented musicians there really are. I think a lot of us got to that point where we're like, "All right, got to shut my parents up. This isn't going to work, and, and I got to get a real <laughs> job." But still, still never you know never gave up the uh, the dream. I suppose, right? <laughs> yeah, I've uh, played mostly guitar and uh, and haven't played much for the last uh, few years. So I just actually just recently brought the guitar back up to my studio space when I'm like rendering a video or something where I've got like a good little time out. I can pick it up and practice a little bit, but, uh, similarly used to playing a couple of bands like right after college and then started my business and then music kind of got the back seat. but, uh, looking forward to ramping that back up as both of my kids started playing too. So it's a lot of, that's great. A lot of fun to jam with them. That's the best. It's it's my 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 older son plays several instruments too, and it's 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 a lot of fun. And even my my younger guy doesn't. He's like, oh, it's not for me. But he 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 picks up a guitar so every so often and knows knows his way around the fretboard a bit. So nice. and thankfully, I've been you know my my wife has been great about the fact that music's always been important. So I've always done something, whether it's you know even just having some different people I played with over the years over the house and grabbing a guitar or bass or whatever's around and playing with them. Or, you know, just going downstairs and banging away on the drums along to, you know, along to moving pictures or something. So <laughs> my wife has been very tolerant of that over the years. Nice. It's a great outlet. Um, well, hey, Bill, before we let you go, any uh, challenges, requests, encouragements for the audience? Again, just, you know, everybody just just don't don't take any crap from anybody and be yourself. 
Love it. Um, tell us a little bit about where people can find uh, you and Mancini Duffy online. Sure. So uh, we have a fairly robust social media presence that's uh, at Mancini Duffy on Instagram. Um, I think it's Mancini Duffy and LinkedIn and Facebook. You can just find it there. Um, our website has a lot more about our firm. And, um, you know, if you have a, a decent sense of humor and aren't offended easily, you can follow me on Instagram. But if you are, <laughs> then just pretend we, I didn't say that. Cause, cause I, I tend to say whatever I'm going to say, and for better or worse. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, we'll link to you all of those things on the show notes over at obsessedshow.com. You can find the latest episode and click through there. Again, this episode will be live everywhere you listen to podcasts and on YouTube as well at youtube.com slash Josh Miles. Um, Bill, thanks so much for being on the show today. Hey, my pleasure. I had fun. Thank you. Yeah, good uh, chatting with you and thank you for being obsessed with design. Okay, kids, that's episode number 173 in the books. For all of today's show notes, head over to obsessedshow.com. Add your email address to our newsletter. I'll update you on some of my favorite new episodes and some cool things I find in my daily obsessions. Of course, all the links are over at obsessedshow.com to all the places you can find this show, iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, Google Play, and Spotify. So no matter where you find your podcasts, chances are you can listen to Obsessed Show from there. Just head over to obsessedshow.com. The Obsessed Show is produced by yours truly, Josh Miles. To have me speak or MC at your next event, head over to joshmiles.com to learn more. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.